When we talk about the hip, right? Uh, like Lisa said, this is, uh, this is a ball and socket, right? And the ball is covered with that white shiny cartilage and so is the inside of the socket. And that's what deteriorates with osteoarthritis. So a hip replacement is a matter of replacing the ball and socket with a combination of metal and plastic. If you looked at an arthritic hip, you'd see that the ball has this white shiny cartilage that is in tatters and, and is thin, right? And, and same with the inside of the cup. So when we do a hip replacement, we have to get down below the muscles like we talked about. We remove the ball, okay? And then we, we put a metal cup on the inside, then a plastic cup inside the metal cup, and then a metal stem, and then a ball. That's it. It's so simple. simple. Right. <laughs> Easy, right? Everybody who's had one can say, oh, it's a piece of cake. Anybody can do that. Anybody can have one. But that's what a hip replacement is. And this is what's been around for a while. So it's essentially a few parts. It's a metallic stem that fits into the thigh bone with a ball on top of it, a metallic cup that sits into the pelvis with plastic inside. So that's a hip replacement. And you say, well, you know, what's, what's all this about anterior hip surgery? What, you know, what does that mean? And why is that a, a big topic? Why do we see that in the paper? And why does everyone want to get it done with the anterior? Well, you've got to think, okay, what does anterior and posterior mean? Anterior means the front, right? And posterior, the back. The idea is still the same. Either way we do it, we still have to get that combination of metal and plastic into the bone, right? So the bone is kind of in the middle. So if the bone is in the middle, what's the big deal on whether you go in through the, the front of the hip or the back of the hip? Well, it has to do with how the muscles are arranged. And I wanted you guys to spend some time memorizing this slide yeah. because we're going to talk about it at the end, right? <laughs> we'll start from number one and go down. The reason for this slide is just to show you that the, the anatomy is different in the front of the hip and the back of the hip, okay? This is the back. Right? This is the posterior, right? So those are, the, those are the, the gluteus muscles. And you can see that in the back, the muscles move in this direction. That's even at the first layer. Then if you go down in a deeper layer, the muscles still move in that side-to-side -side way, right? Okay. In the front, it's different. In the front, the muscles move in an up-and-down way, okay? And when muscles end up at a bone, they end up at a tendon that attaches to the bone, right? So if you can imagine, the hip joint is underneath here. And the only way to get to it is to remove some of these tendons from the bone, actually separate the muscles from the bone, and get down into the joint. Where this one, you don't, the hip joint is in here. And so to get to it, there is a way to spread those muscles apart. So that is really the difference. So when we do hip surgery from the front, we can spread the muscles apart and enter into the hip joint. This is the hip joint underneath. Now this is nothing new. You know, when you look at this, you know, we have these cartoons here, but what we're showing is that showed the posterior. Everybody knows what that is, the, the back. And the anterior is in the front. So the incision is just below the waistline in the thigh. In the, in the lateral, in the side of the thigh, right? The muscles are spread apart, and there's the hip joint right there, okay? And then, so very simply, we just kind of slide in the ball and socket. Even easier now, yeah, right? right? So you say, well, you know, is this something new, right? Is this, is this way to get into the hip joint? Is that, could, that, could that really be new? And the answer is no, that a long time ago, and, and some of you might remember that, you know, tuberculosis was a bad problem for a long time, right? And one of the places that tuberculosis went was into the hip joint. Getting some feedback. So, so a long time ago, surgeons figured out how to drain tuberculosis out of the hip. And how did they do it? In the 1940s, they did it this way. They separated the muscles because they said, oh, all the muscles in the hip go up and down, so if we want to get into the hip joint, let's just separate them. So, so, hip replacement, so hip surgery from the front was common in the 40s and 50s, right? 
And so then some of the pioneers in joint replacement surgery said, well, if this is how we know how to operate on the hip, and we're having this new technology of replacing body parts, why not put the hip joint in through the front, right? And so that's how it was done. The original hip replacements were done by spreading the muscles in the front and getting the hip joint in. And so, so why is this suddenly something new? You know, you know, all this time later, 70 years later, why is it such a big deal? Well, what happened was those early hip replacements, right? And they were kind of uh, small and rudimentary and they were very easy to get in through the front because they were small, right? But the problem was they didn't stick to the bone and they failed and they didn't work, right? The technology didn't work. Even though the surgeons knew how to put it in through the front, the technology didn't work and so the failure rate was very high. So what happened as technology advanced, in 1962, John Charnley in England came up with the idea that the reason why hip replacements are failing is because they're not attaching to the bone. And so he came up with this stainless steel implant that was very long, much, much longer than those other implants that you saw, right? And this worked, right? But the problem was this implant was too big to put in from the front. Just the way we had to move, they had to move the legs to get it in, it was too big to put in. So he figured out a way to put it in from the back and the side. The only way to get it in from the back and the side was to separate the tendons and muscles. To actually separate them, put this in, and then reattach them, either with sutures or wires. And it worked, right? And it worked. And the implant lasted, and it lasted. This was called the low friction arthroplasty, and it lasted and it was a breakthrough, so everybody said, well, that's the way to do it. The problem is, when you separate those muscles and tendons and ligaments, they take a long time to heal. So even though this implant worked and it lasted for years, the recovery was a long time, right? Because you had to let all those tendons and ligaments heal. So posterior hip surgery became very common because the technology advanced to this size. This is a stainless steel type implant. So through the years, Materials have changed, right? Our understanding of the anatomy has changed, the different sizes of implants we've, we've needed. And then so the materials have also changed from stainless steel to cobalt chrome to a new super alloy that can be made much smaller and still be as strong or stronger than stainless steel, and that's titanium. So here we are now in 2014, all the hip replacements we put in pretty much are made out of titanium. And because they're made out of titanium, we can make them smaller again. And they're smaller and they stick to the bone. They last, right? And so then folks said, well, if these are smaller implants, why not put them in through the front again like we tried the first time in the 1950s? And so that's where we are now. So this brand new technique of anterior hip surgery is actually redoing what somebody figured out a long time ago. But the technology has changed. The implant technology has changed and also the technology we use in the operating room has changed. This is what the modern operating table looks like, right? I'm talking about this is the latest operating room table for hip replacement surgery. This is what we call the HANA table, right? And you say, I know what you're saying. He just said, oh, you know, the reinvention of the anterior approach was something that was designed a long time ago. And some of you are saying this looks pretty familiar too. And anybody who's been to London, the Tower of London has seen the rack, right? <laughs> and that's what it looks like. So it's a reinvention of the rack. And the idea is that when somebody is on that table, just like the rack, you can strap their legs into it and you can move the hip around. You can separate the joint. You can do things with it that you can't do in the operating room if you just have you and your assistants. But you can crank this rack a little bit and move things open and it's a holder. It's a giant holder. Right? So this is what the invention is that has propelled uh, uh, hip replacement surgery, anterior hip surgery in the operating room to a different level. So when we look at these things, you know, this is a holder that lets us get into the hip joint and move the ball and socket around and still have access through that same interval that does not cut the muscles and tendons. So anterior hip surgery, the advantage is you know, using the new technology of titanium and smaller implants 
and a reinvention of the rack, which is the fancy schmancy OR table that we use now that can pull the leg apart, we have a faster recovery, right? Compared to what I was doing 15 years ago or even six years ago, folks recover much faster. Walk the same day as the operation, stay in the hospital for two days, right? Less weakness because when we spread the muscles apart to put the implant in, instead of taking the tendons apart, the muscles are much stronger right from the beginning. And, and also, there's no restrictions. Many of you in this room who have had a hip replacement were given a list of things you were not allowed to do, because if you did them, something bad was going to happen. And the reason you got that list of hip restrictions uh, or hip precautions was because the muscles were too weak to hold the ball and socket together until it healed. But now that we don't have to separate the muscles and tendons, uh, folks don't have any restrictions. So they can do what they want right away. So this, the advantage of anterior hip surgery is that people get moving faster and they have no restrictions. And the whole idea of joint replacement surgery is to maintain health. So this is not to get people out of the hospital faster, but to get them off their back so they don't get other conditions, other problems that are related to laying around the hospital for a long time. So anterior hip surgery is something new that uses a lot of old ideas with the new technology.